We are now going to do a full model building example with the place kicking data set. What that basically means is we're going to start at the beginning where we have some data and we need to decide what variables we should include in a logistic regression model to estimate the probability of success. Then we're going to use these variables to try to refine our model. Uh, for example, like explore interaction terms, explore maybe transformations, and then also assess the model's fit, you know, determine if there are outliers or influential observations. And these, this might lead us to changes in our model. Then once we get through all that and, and find one final model, then we're going to interpret it. So this example here basically takes into account everything from chapter 5, and then the interpretation part uses the material from chapter 2. So overall, I feel as though that this is a really good example of what you would typically be face outside of a classroom situation where you have some data and you need to develop a model for it and then to interpret the model. Now, the data that we're going to use here is a slightly modified version of the data that we've been using previously. And so this is the actual data file that we're going to be using. It has actually 13 more observations in it than what we've seen previously. As we go through this model building process, you're going to see why in the end we actually end up removing these 13 observations so that we can work with a model just uh, using the remaining observations and then that will be what we end up um, using for our final model uh, and then also interpret. Now also in this data set, there are four other variables that we haven't talked about um, before. So, for example, there is the altitude variable. This just measures how high up the city is in terms of altitude um, for where the place kick occurs. The reason why this variable would be important to look at is if you're a football fan, you know that footballs tend to travel farther uh, for high altitude cities because there's less air density. We'll also look at a variable for home is the place kick being done at the place kicker's home stadium or is it at their opponent's stadium? Precip for is there precip precipitation falling at game time? And then lastly, temperature. Okay, so the very first thing that you would do in a model building uh, situation is that you would need to select which variables to include in the model. And we've talked about a number of different ways to do it. The way that I would approach it typically in this kind of a situation since we have a significant number of variables and I also I want to look at interactions is I would use the GL multifunction with main effects and two-way interactions that would be plausible for the particular situation and then use the genetic algorithm to choose amongst these terms. Now what are potential plausible interactions? This is where if you have experience in the subject matter, you can use that information to come that come up with that. So for example, I'm a big football fan, so I know that distance and altitude, that interaction, logically, it could be very important. Because if the ball uh, can travel farther when it's a high altitude situation, that means longer place kicks may now have a higher probability of success than before. So therefore, it makes sense to look at the interaction. How altitude is going to affect the response variable is dependent upon what the corresponding distance is. And so here I have some other listed interactions as well. Now, this is not all possible interactions that could uh, be used amongst these variables. Uh, there are some, very, some interactions that make just no sense, so I don't want to even look at those. And so inside the GL multifunction, there is an, actually an argument called exclude that will, well, should, I should say, should help you exclude those interactions. Unfortunately, that argument doesn't work. And that's been a, um, a problem that has been out there now for uh, some period of time. And so unfortunately, then, I can't use the genetic algorithm. I cannot use GL multi like how I want to. So instead, what I decided to do for this particular situation is I'm going to use the dredge function 
to search amongst all the main interaction, I'm sorry, the main effects terms uh, first, uh, using all possible uh, regression. I'm going to use the AIC as my information criteria value. The reason why I chose that versus uh, the BIC is because uh, you know the BIC is going to result in likely less variables uh, to be included in a model. But however, I see this more as an exploratory study, so I don't want to exclude something that you know may have some evidence that it is important. Uh, so because of that, I'm okay with having a potentially larger model in the end, and so I'm going to use the AIC. Okay, so let's look at how we implement some of this stuff in R. Now, almost all of the R code that I'm going to uh, have in my notes here is review, because this, again, this particular example is going to put together all the stuff that we've seen in Chapter 5, and then eventually, for the interpretation, the stuff that we've seen in Chapter 2. So for that reason, I'm not going to go over the R code in depth, except for some small specific places where it would be kind of new for us to see it. So to begin here, I then read in my data. I estimate a model that has all of my explanatory variables in it, including those additional ones. So for example, here is altitude. And then I use the dredge function to do all subsets, all subsets regression. And this is what I come up with. So the model with the smallest AIC has change, distance, PAT, and wind in it. Now, I would still like to look at interactions. And so one approach then is to say, okay, I have these main effects in my model, these uh, four variables. How about we look at all possible pairwise interactions amongst those corresponding variables, but look at the interactions only that are plausible, that make sense relative to the actual um, place kicking. And so in, in, the, in that case, if you look at through all my uh, interactions that I showed you before, that means we have three interactions to look at. And one way then to look at these is to use a forward selection process. So what I do is I estimate my model that has, let's say my, the model is, let's say my beginning model where I have the main effects that I've chosen already. And then I look at a full model that contains all the interactions terms. And I basically want to see is there something in between those two models uh, that best fits the data. And so I use the step function to do the forward selection with the AIC. This is what ends up happening then. I have two interactions that are suggested that should be included in the model. Distance in win and distance in PAT. Now there are actually other justifiable approaches that could have been used other than using forward selection amongst these interactions. So for example, I could do a version of all subsets regression where I look at the two to the three or eight different possible models that can result from including those main effects and also these uh, including or excluding then the corresponding interactions. If one would do that, you would get the same model as what I got here. Now another thing that one could do is let's say calculate the AIC for models that include some of the interactions that are plausible relative to this uh, data example. What that means is, for example, uh, you know, we talked about distance and altitude. Uh, that makes sense for football fans to look at that. And, but the problem is, is altitude uh, was not originally selected as a main effect. So what I could do is temporarily put altitude and the distance and altitude um, terms in my model, calculate the AIC, I get 777.32, and then compare it to the model that I had previously from the forward selection. That particular AIC is right there, or excuse me, right there, 773. So we can see the AIC actually goes up when I do include uh, altitude and distance and altitude. So therefore, I would not want to include it. Now, for football fans out there, you might be wondering, well, why isn't this important? You know, it's generally thought of that altitude 
matters in place kicking. And the reason is, or at least the reason I think this is, is because um, there's only one place in the National Football League where altitude truly matters in terms of that it is actually high up altitude, and that is in Denver. Also, the uh, the number of place kicks where altitude is going to have any kind of effect is going to be very small during a football season because there's not going to be that many where it's ex an extremely long distance where altitude potentially could turn a let's say success I'm sorry to turn a failure into a success. So because there are so few place kicks where this will actually matter, this is probably why the distance and altitude interaction comes up as not necessarily proven to be important. Okay. So, given my model so far, I have those four main effects. I have the two interactions. Let's now investigate possible improvements to the model. So the first thing that I do is I convert the data to EVP form. Notice here I have 1438 observations. I have 124 unique explanatory variable patterns. Now when I did convert it to explanatory variable form, let me just mention this. When I use the aggregate functions, what we've done before, notice I just have the main effects variable names in there. I don't need to put the interaction terms in there because that's not going to cause a, uh, a different number of explanatory var variable patterns since the, the original variables are already in there. You can include that in there if you want to and try it on your own and see that that is not going to have an effect. So whenever you convert to explanatory variable pattern form, it's always good to re-estimate your model um, using this format, compare it to your previous um, Bernoulli format, you could say, uh, just to make sure everything matches up, and it does. Now, what about transformations, then, of our terms? Well, you know, we have these variables that are ones and zeros for their values. So if I were to square a one, I get a one. If I were to square a zero, I get a zero. So like using a quadratic term really doesn't make sense in this situation for those particular variables. Other transformations don't make sense as well because these are just one and zero values. But with respect to distance, you know, it might be interesting to look at, see if there's some kind of nonlinear effect relative to um, comparing to the logit of pi, you know, maybe there's a, maybe a quadratic is of interest. So what one could do then to see if, do we have, let's say, distance in the model in the correct form, is we could plot the standardized residuals versus distance. If there is some kind of pattern in that plot, then that suggests that maybe some kind of transformation of distance could be helpful. And so what we see in this plot, where the red line is a lowest regression model there, that's approximating the trend there, we can see this uh, line is pretty much hugging zero. And what we see here then is that there doesn't appear to be really a trend amongst the standardized Pearson residuals. Also, some other things that we see is that, you know, notice all my standardized Pearson residuals are within plus or minus three. Uh, so that's a good sign as well. And so based upon this, then, I don't really have evidence to suggest that some kind of transformation is needed. Now, if one wanted to, one could also maybe plug in a distance square in your model, um, calculate the AIC, and if one did that, we can see that the AIC is still higher than the model that has just uh, the distance alone without the distance squared. So therefore, I don't want to consider it further. Now, one important thing here is that when you do calculate these AICs or BICs, um, <clears throat> make sure that you're calculating and doing the comparison uh, with the same format of your data in terms of explanatory variable pattern form or using this um, Bernoulli format for the good variable in this case. Because otherwise, the likelihood function actually will change some, and then that will cause a change to the, uh, the information criteria. So in this particular case, this AIC is actually calculated using the original format of the data itself rather than the EVP form. Okay. So now let's do some assessment of the model's fit. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And so I'm going to use my examine.logistic.reg function as what we've done before to assess the miles fit. And let's take a look at the plots that are produced. So for the first plot, we have the standardized Pearson residuals versus the estimated probabilities. And so what we see is that, you know, everything's within plus or minus three. Okay, that's great. That's a good sign. I've highlighted some particular, um, um, let's say, observation or explanatory variable pattern numbers here uh, so that we can see that, yeah, there are some outside plus or minus two, so it doesn't hurt to maybe take a closer look at those shortly. When we look at the plot of the Cook's distance versus the hat matrix diagonal values, we do have some stuff that is popping up that is perhaps of concern to us. So we should make note of that, and we're going to go back to those uh, particular um, observations shortly. Delta x squared versus pi hat. And again, this just represents the square of what was on the y-axis for the, um, the first plot. And we can see that we have these patterns that one would typically expect with these points, and that's not necessarily unusual. Notice here's where 9 is, and again, we don't have anything above 9. But still, we might want to take a closer look at some of these. Notice, for example, how observation 15 seems to have a little bit larger circle than some of the other ones there. The circle, again, is proportional to the number of, of um, um, number of trials for a particular EVP. And so that's something that we want to look at. Here's delta x squared versus the estimated probabilities. And we can see, for example, so here's 101 there. We can see 101 there. Uh, note that, again, the, in case I didn't say this, the plotting points proportional to the Cook's distance. And so we can see why this plotting point is a little bit larger than other ones. Uh, this very large plotting point here that's not labeled happens to be 120. <coughs> and so, you know, we're coming up with similar conclusions here that, you know, there might be some observations that are influential that we want to look at further. Okay. And so, uh, let's see, on page 12 here just kind of summarizes what I just said. Okay. Now let's look at these particular highlighted values on the plot further. And so what I do here is I take my original um, explanatory variable pattern form data, and similar to what we've done before, I put in pi hat, the standardized Pearson residuals, the Cook's distance values. If you want to see the hat matrix diagonal values, you can include those, and also those tail probabilities using that binomial distribution approximation. I put this all into a data frame called w.n.diag1. And next, what I would like to do um, is, instead of looking at all, I think it was 124 different explanatory variable patterns, and by, you know, let's say printing off, you know, just this particular uh, data frame, what I would like to do is only print off those rows in the data frame corresponding to EVPs that I like to investigate further. So, what I can do is this. I'm going to take the absolute value of those standardized Pearson residuals. Values outside of plus or minus 2, per, perhaps, are ones that we want to look at further. So, this segment of code that I'm highlighting here, if I were just to execute that, that would give me some trues and falses. True for a particular um, EVP that is greater than two in terms of the absolute value for the standardized Pearson residual, false otherwise. Now also with Cook's distance, we have a particular criteria where we look to see is it greater than four over the sample size. So I can take my Cook's distance and compare it to four over that sample size. And again, I'm gonna get trues for when this occurs, falses otherwise. And then when I combine this segment of code here together, where I'm combining it based upon this vertical line. That vertical line means or. And so I might have a situation where I have, let's say, a true or a true, and R is going to interpret this as a true. I might have other situations where I have a false and a true. False or true ends up being a true. False or a false ends up being a false. And so I'm going to also do exactly the same thing with these hat matrix diagonal values. 
And I'm going to put these trues and falses into something called check.out or ck.out. And when check.out is a true, that's going to correspond to one of those 124 observations that I want to look at further. When it's false, I don't need to look at it. And so then when I can put this in the row number area for where I've saved my my explanatory variable pattern data, where I save uh, my corresponding diagnostic measures. What's going to happen is that, is that only those rows that correspond to a true are going to be put into extract.evps. And I can do something if I want to do a little bit more fancy. How about I order these by the distances, so that 18, 19, 20, and so on, and print off then these orders by distance. Make sure you go through this code on your own, ex execute it one step at a time, just to make sure that you do verify what's going on here. And so this is what I get. Okay. So this is a lot easier to look at than if I were to look at all 124 at the same time. That's why I did this. Now, what we're going to see here is many of these explanatory variable patterns have very few observations. So if I were to try a continuous distribution approximation with them, and that would be with the standardized Pearson residuals, this is just not going to work out well in terms of that continuous distribution approximation is not going to be good. So for example, let's look at number 60. This is an 18-yard uh, distance place kick. It's attempted when change is equal to 1, meaning that there's pressure. There happens to be one success out of two trials. A very high probability of success, though, by the model. You know, observed, it was just 1 out of 2, or 0.5. My standardized Pearson residual is a negative 2.57. So that's lower than that negative 2, indicating, hey, we might want to look at it further. Here's the tail probability, 0.12. So what this says then to me is that this is not necessarily an unusual situation to have something like this to occur. Um, you know, 12% of the time, on average, you would expect values outside of negative 2.57, or the absolute value of negative 2.57. So this is not unusual. And you know, the reason why we got this large and absolute value of the standardized Pearson residual was more due to, let's say, the binary nature of this data and trend, trying to use this continued dis, continuous distribution approximation, which is not going to work well when you only have two trials. So I'm not worried about that particular EVP at all. Worried in terms of it being fit poorly by the model or it being, let's say, an outlier. Okay. Now we do have some large Cook's distances here. Um, let's see, let's look at 117 right there. Notice, let me get my highlighter out. This corresponds to 614 different trials of for place kicks. And we only have 1,438 trials overall in the data set itself. So it would make sense then that the Cook's distance, which is 0 0.06 should be relatively large. And so let's actually find this on the plot. So it was 117 right there. And so we can see how it's above that, that, that borderline there, indicating there, there might be an issue. But in the end, I'm not worried about that. Um, I would expect something like this to have some influence since it's such a huge part of the data set. Similar things can be said as well uh, about uh, 121 and 123. Now, fifth, number 15 ca did cause me a little bit of concern, or at least initially. So let's take a look at 15 here. Notice this is 12 successes. Whoops. Actually, I'm not getting the right pen out. Excuse me. I have 12 successes out of 18 trials. So I observed a proportion of success is about 0.67, but the model says it should be 0.87. So there's a little bit of a difference there. I would expect my uh, continuous distribution approximation for the standardized Pearson residual to 
be decent because I have um, 18 number of trials, so I have 19 overall possible values that this standardized Pearson residual could take on. I have a standardized Pearson residual of negative 2.67. This is still within the plus or minus 3 range. Let's take a look at this tail probability. Again, this uses a binomial approximation that tells us how unusual would this be with the binomial distribution. We have 0 0.02. So 2% of the time you would have something this extreme. And so you might be thinking, okay, that's kind of low. I'm worried about that. But in the end, for this particular data set, this is the only time that we ever have one of these tail probabilities being less than 0 0.05. And if I have, I think again, 124 different EVPs, you know, I would expect, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, about 5% of them. Well, yeah, about 5%, or which would be about, I think about six total times where I would have something this extreme. In this case, I have one. Um, and in the end, it's not really too extreme. So because of that, I'm not necessarily concerned about that EVP. I don't think it's, I don't think it's being fit. I don't think there's a problem with the model fit. It's just, you know, you're going to have some cases like this, you know, like 5% of the time. Now, what is of concern to me is number 120. <coughs> okay. Remember, this had a very large Cook's distance. And Cook's distance again measures influence. And so if I go back to this particular EVP, let me get my pen out again. So 120. It's a 30 yard place kick. It's a PAT. There were three successes out of four trials. The Cook's distance was 0.31. This is an interesting case. At this time in the NFL, when I collected the data, almost all PATs were 20 yards. Very few would be something different. It would have to be due to like a penalty, for example, on the kicking team for it to be longer than 20. And so this is a very unusual situation. And it just so happened there was one out of four that was missed. But one can also look at number 119. It has a Cook's distance that stands out a little bit too. Notice, 20 yard distance, PAT1, so it is a PAT rather than a field goal. Zero successes out of one trial. There's the Cook's distance of 0 0.07. So that one also has, has some, seems to maybe be somewhat influential too, at least by the Cook's distance measure. And it's this unusual situation of a non 20 yard. PAT. Okay. So whenever I have something like this occur, to actually confirm that indeed it's influential and maybe it's actually a detriment to the model, what you need to do is as follows. Temporarily remove those corresponding observations, uh, so for 119 and 120, from the data set and re-estimate the model. Look at your parameter estimates. Do they change in comparison to what you had before when um, these were in the mod, uh, I'm sorry, in the data set? If they do change, then that confirms indeed that it is influential, and then you're going to need to decide what to do. So let's look at, look at how we can remove these particular um, uh, EVPs. Now, in my data argument for GLM, normally I would have w.n. That's my full data set. If I want to, let's say, exclude a particular EVP, I can just simply do this, WN bracket minus 120 comma M bracket. So what this says is with respect to the rows, use all the rows except 120. That's what the minus does. And since I also want to exclude 119 as well, I can combine this together with the C function and estimate the model that way. So this is what I get. The big change is this right here. Distance in PAT, the estimate for that interaction, that beta, beta hat, is positive. Before, we had negative 0.2717. Um, 
also before the p-value is 0 0.0056, indicating that, yeah, there's, there's good evidence that indeed that uh, this interaction term is important. But now, look at that. The p-value is 0 0.79, a dramatic change. So what I've just confirmed then is that indeed, 119 and 120 are influential. They change my understanding of this place kicking process. Okay, so what, what, what should I do then? Here are three options. All of them are justifiable, but in the end you gotta pick one and I'll tell you why I picked one of them. We could, let's say, just leave these EVPs, 119 and 120, in the data set. Keep the interaction in the model, in this case, I just need to live with the fact that being influential. So if I was writing a paper on this, I would say, okay, these EVPs were influential. Um, they are essentially the cause for having this distance and PAT interaction in the model. And just leave it at that. It's not necessarily ideal, uh, but uh, that's what you would need to do. Another option is this. Take out all non-20R PATs out of the data set and also remove that interaction from the model. Now, when one does something like that, it changes your data set. What this does, it changes your, let's say, your population of inference. So notice I'm removing all non-20-yard PATs. There's actually other non-20-yard PATs that are in the data set. In fact, there's actually a total of 13 different uh, trials where this occurred. So it's not just for 119 and 120. By removing that from my data set, now I can no longer draw conclusions or make inferences about situations where there's a non 20 yard PAT. In the end, it's really not that big of a deal because it's a rare thing that happens in football. Um, so that's why this is justifiable to do. Alternatively, I could do even something more dramatic. I could remove all PATs from the data set and just say, okay, I got to treat those separately from the field goals because something's going on with the PATs. And so I could re-go through the model building process with just the field goals. And if one wanted to, one could form a completely different model for just the PATs as well. Again, all three choices are, are justifiable. My preference is number two, and that's what I'm going to do here. The logic behind it, again, is that these non-20-yard PATs don't occur very often, so I'm not going to limit my population of inference a whole lot. Um, also, um, you know, PATs and field goals are, are quite similar in what they do. The only difference is that, you know, one's one point, the PAT, and one's three points, if successful, the field goal. And so I like to be able to, you know, draw inferences to all of them simultaneously because it seems like this process is very, very similar. Um, and, you know, with only having these 13 place kicks that help me examine essentially should a distance and PAT interaction be important or not, you know, it's not enough to really make a judgment of if I have a real trend here, uh, that indeed that interaction term is important, or maybe it's just an anomaly of the fact that I have binary response outcomes. Now here's a big note, and as you can see with the exclamation mark, it's very, very important. And that is that you need to take caution whenever you change your data set like this. Um, it should only occur if there's a very good justifiable reason. So just because you have something that's influential, or maybe just because you have an outlier, doesn't mean you automatically remove that from the data set. In fact, it in practice is often uh, doesn't happen that often where it is actually justifiable like this. You know, um, very often one or three uh, in terms of those choices are done a lot more than two. I was able to do two because based upon my subject matter uh, experience, I, I, I think I, I have, I'm very comfortable with, with doing this. Okay, so now I have a new data set essentially I'm working with. Well, a, a slightly revised data set, I should say. And so because of that, um, I should say, first of all, I need to actually do the, re do, do the removal. Let's talk about how to do that. And let me actually go over to my program to help demonstrate the process. Um, because it's not, um, if you haven't seen something like this before, it's not necessarily 
um, as straightforward as maybe what you might expect. So I need to remove non 20 yard PATs from my data set. So the first thing I need to do is identify where are the non 20 yard PATs. So what I can do is look at distance and I say, I don't want 20 yard uh, place kicks at all. And so the exclamation mark equal means not equal. And so when I execute that code, I get a bunch of trues and falses. It's going to be true if it's a non 20 yard PAT. It's going to be a false uh, if it is actually a, um, um, a 20 yard PAT. Now note this is with my original data set before I did the EVP form. Now, also I need to identify where the PATs are. So if I look at the PAT variable and do equal equal one, that gives me trues or falses corresponding to the PAT. So when I combine them together, and I want to combine them together essentially with an and, I want non 20 yard place kicks and they have to be PATs. This is what I do. I use the ampersand to help do the combination. So if I page up here, eventually you can see where those trues are. There's going to be 13 trues. Now, I actually want the data set that doesn't have these non 20 yard uh, PATs uh, in it. So if I use an exclamation mark in front of that, that just simply negates what I had before. It turns the trues to falses, the falses to trues. And you can just see that. And there you go. And so those trues then correspond to the rows of the data frame that I want. And so I say, okay, all those trues are going to go into my row part of uh, these brackets for the, for the data frame. And so if I then put then the results into placekick.mb2, uh, this is what I get. And the number of rows is 1425. Now I have the same observations that we had actually had looked at previously in chapter two with the place kicking data set. Okay, let me come back here to Word. Now that I have this modified form of the data set, I need to go through that model building process again, meaning I need to uh, use like the dredge function. I need to do some forward selection amongst the interactions. I need to do all that. And as you might imagine, since very few observations removed, I get the same uh, corresponding main effects and interactions as being important. Of course, though, I do not consider the distance and PAT interaction anymore. So once I do that, then I need to form EVP form once again. Notice I have 119 different EVPs. 1425 observations. I estimate the model again just to make sure that everything looks okay in terms of I would compare it from the EVP form to the original Bernoulli format which I don't show the output for but indeed these beta hats are the same. Then I need to assess the model's fit once again. So I use my examine.logistic.reg function to do that. This is what I get. And we get very similar results to what we had previously in terms of everything was good except for that one, you know, that uh, that 119, that 120 that we saw before. Do note that the numbers here are going to be a little bit different since this, uh, this um, data set is, is slightly different. Um, what I actually do in my program that I don't show here is I, I do examine like 116 a little bit further. You know, I remove it temporarily from my data frame re-estimate the model, see if things change, see if my judgments about uh, the data change, and they don't. Uh, so therefore, then, I'm okay with this model. This is my final model now. So I have distance, wind, change, PAT, and distance and wind in there, where my population of inference is all places that are attempted, except for those non-20 yard PATs. Okay. Next one I need to do is actually interpret my model. Um, now, my corresponding paper associated with this data set uh, talks about the interpretation. I, I encourage you to, to, to read the whole paper and, um, and look at the interpretation. Now, do note that obviously over time things change in terms of 
approaches that we have in statistics, like finding the best model, um, you know, focusing more on profile like a ratio inference versus walled inference. And so you're going to see some differences here. But in the end, uh, in that paper, and now I have ex the same models concluded um, with the same form of the data. Um, and the profile record ratio inferences are very similar to the walled inferences. Okay. So to do profile likelihood ratio inferences, let's say for odds ratios, of course, I use the MC profile package. Make sure you go through the details on your own for why I'm using this as my K matrix. Uh, the words here help explain that. So for example, if I just want to look at change, remember change is a one for, you could say pressure, zero for no pressure or otherwise. Here's my estimated odds ratio. The corresponding, um, actually I did 90% confidence interval is listed there. Now note that when we, whenever we have an odds ratio like this, by default, and I use the, essentially the default here, um, change equal one would be in the numerator, change equals zero would be in the denominator. And so what we can see here is that the odds ratio, in terms of the confidence interval, is below one. So there is marginal evidence, since this upper bound is quite close to one, there's marginal evidence indeed that there is this that change is important, that there's this pressure effect. Some other things here, for example, we could look at the distance. Let's say we look at a 10 yard decrease in distance under windy conditions. Notice how my uh, confidence interval for, for my odds ratio is all above one, indicating that indeed, if you do lower the distance, um, then your odds of success are higher in this situation, even when you have windy conditions. When it's not windy conditions, again, this 10 yard decrease is important because this interval is above one, but notice where it is. It isn't as high above one as it was for windy conditions. Again, hopefully that makes some sense because windy conditions are, you could say, like a risk factor to doing a place kick because that wind can move the ball around in the air and therefore a place kicker might be more likely to miss. And we can see that by moving 10 yards closer under windy conditions is more beneficial because now you're closer, you're going to have less of a time for wind to affect the ball. You can also look at, let's say, windy versus non-windy conditions here. Notice at a distance of 40 yards is when we have these confidence intervals not contain one anymore. We could look at, let's say, specific cases for place kicks to actually estimate then the probability of success. In this particular case, I decided to look at 20-yard place kicks that were either PATs or field goals. Here are my corresponding estimates. We can see that there's some difference there. We can actually also do then the profile likelihood ratio intervals for that. And so what we see here is that field goals have a lower probability of success than PATs. Um, given everything else in the model remains constant. So, you know, in terms of football, why does this occur? Well, if you're a football fan, you'll probably note that, you know, the defense probably is often um, less, uh, probably less intent on trying to block a PAT versus a field goal. You'll see that when you watch a football game. Probably the reason being is because a PAT is only one point, field goal is worth um, uh, uh, three points. Uh, and and, and it, there's a high probability of success. And so we can see that indeed, this is why the PAT variable was important to include in the model. PATs have a higher probability of success than field goals. Now also, if you read my paper, you'll notice that at the very beginning, I have a poem about a particular field goal kicker by the name of Lynn Elliott, who unfortunately, at the end of a football game uh, for the, uh, he was a kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs. Unfortunately, uh, he missed a particular field goal. If he would have made it, the Chiefs would have um, had, uh, would have most likely uh, still had a chance to win. Uh, but by missing it, it basically ended the game. And unfortunately, he missed the kick. In this particular case, was a 42-yard field goal attempted under pressure situations. Change was equal to one. Here's his estimated probability of success, 0.685. The corresponding interval was 0.63 to 0.74. So we can see that in this particular case, 
field goal, I'm sorry, place kickers in this situation would, generally speaking, make two out of three field goals in this kind of a situation on average. Unfortunately for Lynn Elliott, um, uh, this happened to be, you could say, that one out of three uh, that would be missed. And lastly, we have a way to, let's say, look at the model uh, through some plots. And so let's just consider the field goal situation here. My code's in the program. And here's a really interesting plot. So we have the estimated probability success on the y-axis. We have the distance in yards of the place kick on the x-axis. Again, PAT is equal to zero. And so we have two other binary explanatory variables, change and win. So what we can do is actually plot in the corresponding model for those different scenarios. So in the case where change is equal to zero, wind is equal to zero. So it's not windy, it's not under pressure situations. You could say maybe this is the least risky situation for a place kick. We can see with the red here, this is where the estimated probability of success would be corresponding to our model. But then when we add a risk factor, let's say now we do have pressure, look what happens. The estimated probability of success goes down. It shows you the effect that change has. If I have, let's say, wind, so I have windy conditions, look at this. Look how far that goes down from the case where change was zero, wind was zero. And why does it decrease so much more there? It's because of the interaction term. As the kick becomes longer, the interaction term is going to have more of an effect on um, that probability of success for the place kick. It makes sense relative to football in terms of the longer the ball is in the air, in terms of the longer the distance, the more time the wind has to affect that place kick. Then in, let's say, the most risky condition, change is equal to 1, wind is equal to 1, again, we even see it, it drop down even further. One could also do confidence interval bands, and that's what I do uh, here for the least risky scenario, change equals 0, wind equals 0, versus the most risky scenario, change equal 1, wind is equal to 1. And we can see that about at 38 yards, it's kind of an ad hoc way to show differences here, and about 38 yards and above, uh, that's when those uh, intervals no longer um, overlap. Um, so this is essentially a full data analysis here with the place kicking data set. It starts with uh, determining which variables to include in the model, uh, talks about how to adjust the model, some interesting um, things that happen along the way, which is why I really, really like this data set to use for a teaching situation. And then it concludes this example with interpreting the model, basically applying the stuff from chapter two. So I hope you have found in this, um, um, this example to be very, very useful.